Sky Talkers is a member of the Star Wars Escape Pods Network. Explore more great content and get to know our sister shows at WeAreEscapePods.com and on Twitter at WeAreEscapePods. The Star Wars Escape Pods Network, promoting positivity in fandom. Before he was flying casual with Chewie, our favorite smuggler was just a scrum rat on Corellia. Solo is finally out and it's time to dive in and unpack every Aura Sing detail. Put down the Sabat cards and let's get started. Welcome to Sky Talkers. Here are your hosts, Charlotte and Caitlin. Hello! And welcome to Sky Talkers. I'm your host, Charlotte. Hey guys, I am your other host, Caitlin. And that was a really long hello. <laughs> it was so long. Long. I think too long. I'm just gonna put that out there. Okay, too I'll shorten long. it next time. All right. <laughs> um, we are here today to finally break down solo beyond our immediate reaction. <laughs> yeah. I- it's so strange. We were talking about this earlier, but I feel like we've been talking about Solo so much together since we couldn't talk about it in a public way um, from the <laughs> premiere that I already feel like we've done this in-depth breakdown, but we have not. And uh, I feel like we're actually a little bit behind maybe, but I think it's good too, because now we've had time to digest our own thoughts. We've listened to other shows about it. And I think now... We are ready to dive deep, to dive into the world of Han Solo. Totally. I am with you. And at this point, Caitlin and I have seen the movie a total of four times, even though honestly, it feels like three, just because the first time we saw it was a whole three and a half weeks ago at this point. And it's like, it it feels like, I don't know, when this new Star Wars movie is out, it feels like you should be watching it in the theater. And so we saw it three times last weekend, but we didn't see it this weekend, which is kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Hoping to see it again. I, I want to I wanna see this at least two more times, I think, in the theater. Um, but I don't want to like delay too much about getting into this discussion. But just before we jump in, I want to say that Caitlin is in Boston right now with me, and we are in the same place at the same time together. So I just want to apologize that this audio isn't as clear as it usually is because we are, we're usually talking to each other, honestly, over the internet, mm-hmm. and we can deal with that. <laughs> we, we deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But here we are. We're not in an enclosed environment, not totally soundproofed. We're in the public space of my apartment, and <laughs> I apologize if there's like any sort of echo or anything. When you say public space, it kind of makes it sound like we're in a library or something, just like recording our podcast in the, sci- <laughs> in the sci-fi section. <laughs> Honestly, I'd be down. I mean, yeah, it'd be interesting. Like, I wonder who would come by. Yeah. Do a live podcast in a library. Yeah, So that could be interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Charlotte said, we are, I am up in Boston with her for a little bit on my way up to New York for a summer internship. So we're hanging out here, having a lot of fun and doing a lot of Star Wars, but I'm really excited to actually discuss this on the podcast. So uh, let's break down our parts. So we're going to follow the same format that we have for past um, shows where we break down the Star Wars films. So part one is going to be all about the story. And part two is going to be the characters. And then part three is going to be our catch-all and where we answer some listener questions from you guys. So without further ado, let's get started. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first? All right. Welcome to part one where we're going to be breaking down the story and plot lines of Solo. (laughs) Um, Solo feels a lot different than I think our, our other saga films and different from Rogue One too. Um, what do you think about the format of Solo? It's funny. I don't think it's, I mean, I think that yes, it's visually different. It feels different because we're, we have all these like familiar characters and everything, but I don't think that Solo is necessarily super different in a way, I think that it follows a similar format than like say Rogue One does because, you know, you open with a a time period of like the younger self and then it catapults a couple years and maybe even a couple more after that. Am I wrong about that? I'm totally wrong about that. that. You're very wrong. You're very wrong about that. (laughs) But basically, okay, so that further proves my point though (laughs) in that Rogue One has one you know, a, a, you see Jin as she's younger, and then it goes forward into her older years, right? Mm-hmm. And same with Han here. And I feel like 
this is you don't get a time jump situation in um, the saga films at all. We did get flashbacks. Flashbacks are different than which like we were a, very surprised. Uh, three years later or something like that. Yeah, and I think that this to me is potentially the new format for the standalones. It's not. It wasn't like completely unfamiliar for me as much as it as Rogue One's was to me. I was like, whoa! I can't believe this is happening. Yeah, and I I think that the movie much less than like the format, like the the visuals. And the fact that it's a heist movie, it, that's what makes it feels different. Not necessarily like the format. the format, which I think it follows, like I said, a Rogue One similar format where it's like um, flashback and then three separate parts and like three separate uh, planet and location. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think my next question would be, is that how we want the next standalone to go as well? Well, if the next standalone is a solo sequel, I don't really know. I don't know. We'll talk about, about the solo that. sequel yeah. later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, when you bring it up like that, I mean, there definitely is – they're definitely comparable, Rogue One and Solo, as far as the format for how uh, they're laid out. But we've talked about this a lot, actually, in regards to Solo. Solo feels so much more segmented than Rogue One does. It feels very episodic. Yeah. And uh, you brought up this point pretty much right after our first viewing, which I think was – great that solo maybe could have been better suited as like a mini series i think it would be so good and i obviously i thought about this because i was thinking about tandy newton and her in westworld and i love that as like a it's just a fun series it's so great to get into and like you wait for the season and like what you can unpack in that and like any tv show really but i was thinking about that in framing of tandy newton and i was like (laughs) yeah i was like oh my gosh like i feel like this movie would have been so strong as a mini series and even Mm -hmm. like potentially the sequel potential as well like this is like season one and there's like a six episode situation and like it wouldn't feel so and here we are on Corellia, and now we're doing the Imperial part. And then now we're doing, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's just, I feel like it could be, it, it would have felt a little bit more strong as a storytelling mechanism than what we were given. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to be, to start off the show as negative, because I, I think that this movie, I, I feel like I like it maybe a little bit more than some people that I've seen on the internet talk about it. I think it's a fun Star Wars movie that I could see myself watching a lot. But I do feel like there are some parts of this that feel like a TV show mm-hmm. almost. And I, that's not bad because, I mean, Star Wars came from that, like, serialized um, Saturday morning. Yeah, like, it's, like, in its foundation. Exactly. And I feel like that is – it's part of it. But in this world where we can have these, like, gritty, experimental, like, character-focused television shows and miniseries, I really do feel like Solo had a potential to go that route in – I, I kind of mourn that, what it never was. I completely agree. Like, when you said this, it just – I was like, yes. Like, this is what Solo needed mm-hmm. to be because Solo is really fun. And But we were even talking about this in regards to our Last Shot discussion about how it feels so episodic and, like, Last Shot doesn't necessarily have to connect – to Solo in such a big way because it is like Han Solo's life. The idea is that he just goes on all of these different adventures and you never really know everything that Han Solo has Mm -hmm. been up to, but you know, he's done a lot of stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I think that would have been so great to have seen that throughout all of these like different seasons, like to have like a two or three season run of a solo mini series, I think would have been amazing. And I think like what you said, this film for me and, and Charlotte likes solo a lot more than I do. I I like solo a lot. Um, but for me, it's, I don't know. I feel like it's stronger for you. Yeah, I think. Um, but I do like solo and I think it has a lot of really positive things in it. But for me, I was always, I was kind of a little bit let down with the structure of it. Um, if that makes sense. And we'll get to this a little bit later, I think, in this section. But, like, the the way the story ends doesn't really sit well with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like how it ends. And I feel like all these kind of disparate pieces that are kind of coming in and out throughout the film, it just doesn't line up for me as well. And I think you really could have smoothed out those edges if you had a little bit more time with a miniseries and even, like, picking up these different threads in a different season. Totally. And I think it – I think – that would work so much better than a sequel, like a movie sequel for Solo. But it's like it's already done. (laughs) And just like can you imagine the news of like Lord and Miller's 
movie is now being chopped up into a, a mini series directed by Ron Howard. Like, I mean, I, th- I think it would have been crazy. I don't think it's any crazier than <laughs> the, the actual story of yeah. the film production. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think it would have been better because I think that's like part of Han Solo's charm is that he just like bounces around from adventure to adventure <laughs> yeah. and somehow makes it out every time. And it's like, wow. I know. And then like you think about like – how much weight is now put on Star Wars movies and everything. And like that could have definitely been avoided had this been, I mean, I don't, I don't want to dwell on this for too long. I just feel like it, 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 this movie in its, in its nature just feels like it would have been really strong as a series. Yeah. Yeah. And there wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been as much pressure, I think. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah. And like you said, TV, like show TV shows are great. Like Westworld is, you know, Game of okay. Thrones is like, they're it's, fantastic it's all great. films, but it would have been so much lower stakes, I think, for you know having one of your most iconic characters portrayed on the big screen. Whereas now you can take him to the small screen, but spend a lot more time, and maybe even in that format, you can have a little bit more of that comedy tone that Lord, that kind of sounds like Lord and Miller were having. Mm-hmm. But you have the time to do both, right. like that action and that heart, um, and the comedy. Yeah, bit. I don't know. Um, I really liked how when you said that because I was like, I think this, this is what Solo needed for me. Yeah, and I, I do. Think. I feel like the movie is like slightly bumpy in its format in that mm-hmm. way, honestly, because of the director change and like yeah. the so the the time constraint, the shake up, and everything. And you could feel it. Yeah. I feel like in the movie, you could feel like. It, it feels like a Ron Howard movie, in my opinion. But at the same time, you could feel like, oh, this movie. And maybe we just are reading into it too much, but I, I feel like the like, movie has like a couple different tones that are going on, and yeah. and it maybe that would have been solved more with mm-hmm. a television series that you could have di- different directors, different writers in each episode. Who knows? Yeah, I we're think just it, used to that. I think it would have been really interesting, yeah. actually, um, in regards to Han because he is he. I mean, he's defined, but he's not. Yeah, in a, in a weird kind of way. Almost a con of that though is that then we have like this version of Han that is somehow lesser than the Harrison version where I don't like that Mm -hmm. narrative at all because then it's like, oh, like TV version Han and then movie version Han and like they're two different types of people. When I like the whole idea of it all being a level playing field of storytelling where we can have – like say we, I don't know. I think that the mall example is a really good one of like, we have this version of, we have the Sam Witwer version, a uh, voice of mall. And we have the actor of Ray Park in the movie. And like these things can work interchangeably, but that is just never going to happen with like Alden's Han and Harrison's Han. If you do that in like TV and we're, again, we're getting into like a lot of different things or like, yeah. maybe this is just not even about solo at any, any <laughs> but I'm just saying like, I think that, that it had there there is a potential there for things to get a little muddled and like lessen the performances and lessen the movie as a whole where in general I think this is a super fun addition to Star Wars and I don't want it to be lesser than it is already yeah and I guess that's the question it's like what's better kind of putting all your chips in one basket of like sho- kind of shoving Alden as this new han onto the big screen or if you almost like elevate Star Wars TV with an iconic character like Han Solo and give him time to like really work into this character to the point where he could be doing um, improv um, with Han, like what Lord Miller kind of wanted him to do immediately. And it's like, whoa, you can't, you know, you got to kind of walk on eggshells a little bit. Yeah. Um, But it's like Alden season two Han Solo (laughs) – he would have been a lot more comfortable probably and more ready to do that. But I think you're right. It's like you don't – I don't know. I think that's a hard question. And it's kind of like there's – I think it goes back to the whole discussion of did we need a Han Solo thing? And like That's the thing. Is not, that now we're like, okay, maybe we don't need the Han Solo movie at all. Like it could have been a series. Like it's fine. I think that, yeah, we don't need this this movie. I mean, we don't need Star Wars. We don't need any, star, any new <laughs> are, Star Wars We already Wars had movies. six Star Wars yeah. films. Like I think we were okay. I think this is um, a – you know what? This is uh, this is a good time to talk about this. Is this a good entry point into Star Wars? Um, 
I feel like it is. I think it I is. I feel like it is because it's it's contained. It's like a, it pre- piques your interest at the end of like, oh, I don't understand that. Like, all right, let me go into that. It tells like a story of – I don't know. I feel like it is it – does, it's not very weighted and therefore it could be a good entry point. But then again – I would never show someone to stand alone as an entry point to Star Wars. I know, but it doesn't matter. You could you, – you, someone that's dragged to the movies and never seen Star Wars, anything like that. Like you, you don't – you never know how people could enter Star Wars. And I feel I like this true. is okay. No, I don't think it's – no. It's like the thing about Solo is Solo is definitely not a bad movie. Mm-hmm. It's not a great movie. No, and it has good. it has a lot of serious problems in it, but it's certainly not bad. Right. Um so no, I don't think it I don't think it's any more inaccessible than any other Star Wars film. Yeah. Um I think it piques your interest. And the thing it, the thing is like with like if people kind of want to bring up the argument of like, well, there's too many like um Easter eggs. Easter eggs within Star Wars. It's like there are Easter eggs throughout all of Star Wars now because there's so much Star Wars content. It's <laughs> yeah. like, I mean, pick your poison. It's like you could say that like the um, the game table in A New Hope is an Easter egg for what you see in Force Awakens right. if Force Awakens is your first Star Wars <laughs> film. You know, it's like everything feeds into itself now. So, yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. So, I mean, I think that, that as far as like the vocabulary of Star Wars – Mm-hmm. I think you could probably pick that up in any film, I think. So without getting into like the character portion of Han Solo, does this movie focus on Han as much as like the title suggests it does? <laughs> I think so. I mean, I think that clearly the movie is about Han Solo. We start with Han Solo, we end with Han Solo. Yeah. But it's um, – Caitlin and I were just talking about this, so I just kind of want to summarize what we were talking about before is – that Han, the Han Solo movie has a problem and like a prequel problem of the fact is, is that Han's major arc happens in A New Hope and Empire and Return of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. And all of that is the hallmark of Han Solo's character. And it's like we have we have this movie solo now that's at the beginning of all that. And it can't really do that much to change who we see in a new hope. Mm-hmm. And therefore it has a problem of not having this like extremely interesting heroic arc. Yeah. And, or like not even, maybe I shouldn't even say extremely interesting, just like <laughs> a normal heroic arc. It's yeah, just like a, normal it's a little character different. arc. If anything, this movie kind of underscores who we know Han as. And Kira says it, you know, he's the good guy. We understand that because we we see him and this is the beginning of him smuggling and understanding that like, or maybe, and maybe not understanding that like smuggling is like a big business and it's going to cause him issues in the future, right? Yeah, it's strange because Han is the good guy and clearly he's been a good guy but he's also a questionable smuggler. Yeah. I think – and I, I think I brought this up. I bring this up a lot because it's me. Um, but the the whole Dave Filoni thing about Anakin Skywalker yeah. is that in the Clone Wars, you can only take Anakin so far. You can, he can't learn too much or else you don't buy his fall in Revenge of the Sith. And it's the same thing with Han. You can't take him too far because Luke and Leia are his endgame – Luke and Leia are the people that change it all for him. It's not Kira. Yeah. um, And it's not Beckett. Um, They're not the ones that finally make him turn over this new leaf and, like, put away his smuggling life for good. You know? Um, It has to be Luke and Leia, and you can't mess with that. Yeah. but Which I think makes it difficult, and I think is one of the, not problems, but challenges of a film like Solo and of a Star Wars film taking a really well-known character like Han. Um, it would have been different if you have like a Han movie that takes place right after Return of the Jedi because he's like had that big turning point. So uh-huh. now he can have another big turning point in the future. Which you know happens somewhere in between somewhere. these yeah, two movies. Yeah, but this, the weird thing about Han is though is that from what we know so far about his character, and we don't even know that much about him right after Return of the Jedi at this point, but somewhere down the line he backtracks. Yeah. Just like Leia does and just like Luke does. They all backtrack. Um, and he has like his final redeeming moment, I think, with Kylo uh-huh. um, in the end, right before he's killed. killed. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know the scene. Um, but it, I think it is so hard to do these prequel movies about a character who 
has his big moment coming up. Right. Which is a little bit of why Clone Wars can work because yeah. it's episodic mm-hmm. and you can have these tiny arcs and in that way you can focus on a character like Ahsoka. It's why they brought Ahsoka into exactly. the fold is yeah. because they had to have someone – who was there to change and grow in a way that like would reflect upon the characters that we know so well. Yeah. And it's it's funny because if I were to who is the Ahsoka of Solo then? Maybe there it's, isn't. It, yeah. I I seem to think that like maybe it could potentially be Kira because now we see this like different type of heroine of femme fatale and like who she is at the end of this movie is different from how we perceived her in the beginning of the movie in yeah. a much different way than like Han. I, I I don't think that she's the Ahsoka. Yeah. But I think that like that's she's the that's, closest thing. Yes. Because she's like the different type of character that like we are unfamiliar with. This yeah. is like the question mark in Han's life in the biggest way. Yeah, I agree. But at the same time, I would just say it's like you almost can't count who they were in the beginning of the film while they're on Corellia because we don't spend enough time with those people. Yeah. It's like so we jump back into Kira. It's like who has really changed at the end of this film? Mm-hmm. Chewie hasn't changed at all. Lando hasn't changed at all. Kira, in the very beginning, tells Han that she can't run away with him, and right. she doesn't. Um, Beckett's dead. He never changed who he was. Neither did Val or Rio. Like, no one really changed all too much in this film. You, I guess you could say that Han got a little wiser. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't really even seem that much more cynical by the end. You know what I mean? I know. Um, That's why it feels like there's another there's another movie in here. Because right, yeah. they, they set it up for the Jabba thing. They, you know. This, the big the, shot gangster. The big shot gangster putting Plugs together the crew. crew. <laughs> and, like. You know, Kira and Maul, like that is its own interesting thing yes. that I feel like there there are t- two separate stories that could be reworked here to kind of prove even more that Han is cynical. But do people want that? I don't know. I don't know if it really matters. I'm just saying that like we haven't we haven't finished this mm-hmm. version of Han and I don't know if the movie accomplished that. And Again, I'm just saying I don't think this movie is bad. I think it's a really fun time. Yeah. But it didn't it didn't change my perception of Han. If anything, it made me like Han a little bit more because now I understand where he came from. Yeah, and exactly. Like who he is and his past relationships and how he got started as a smuggler and in a way that I didn't feel like I understood in the OT. At the, in the OT at all. Yeah. Right? I think this is this is kind of my barometer for Charlotte and I's reception to a film is when we go to a movie and after we come home, how long is it before we're watching like Last Jedi fan videos? <laughs> and it was like the next day. It was the next day. It was the next day, you know? Yeah. Well, Which is actually pretty, pretty long. long for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, but even after and, – and that was, like, on top of this, like, amazing experience that we'd had. Yeah. So you kind of got to factor that in, too. But it's, like, I definitely don't think about this film as much as I think about The Last Jedi. Um but I think to kind of give it a little bit more of a positive spin, because we both did enjoy this film. We've had a good time with it. What was your favorite, like, episode within Solo? <laughs> um, I think that the Kessel, Kessel breakout is just really fun and yes. great. And every time that scene – I think there's great music. Like, there's a lot of awesome character moments in there. I – Really like L three in that part. I love Lando podcasting. Yeah, the Calrissian Chronicles. I think that uh, that scene is for the story. Like you see a lot of different awesome character elements there. Mm-hmm. So you see, uh, you know, Han and Chewie like working together, and then Han like understanding that Chewie has to do his own thing. That Chewie isn't just there for Han, and that Han like respects that. I think that you see L three like finally finding her stride, like realizing her purpose. And unfortunately, dying, but at least fulfilling what she had always wanted to do. And um, Lando podcasting and also <laughs> like defending his ship, which is great. <laughs> I love the look when someone shoots at I his know. ship and he's like, Excuse, Excuse me? me. <laughs> like, starts shooting back. Totally. And then you see Kira just like being a total badass. Like, um, you mm-hmm. know, it's great. 
yeah, I think I think that really is the like heart of the film where you really get to see these characters shine is in that moment. And yeah, I really liked how you brought up how like Han knows like Han isn't keeping Chewie with him. Yeah, he's not like, dude, we gotta go. He's like, all right, I get it. Yeah, um, and, he, and he's like, I hope I see you soon. Right. And uh, yeah, it's a really nice moment. Um, and uh, I really like that moment. I will say though that I get so excited to see the end showdown between Dryden, um, yeah, 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 Han, yeah, and Kira. Yeah, it's so good. Like, all of them <laughs> kind of going around all of those, like, exhibit spaces. I think it's so great. And I love how Kira is just kind of there, like, plotting. It's funny that you mentioned that because I've last time we were watching it, I was like, I have such a good understand. They did such a good job of framing the room and, like, giving you a clear understanding of, like, where things are and, like, when they're, like, hiding behind certain couches and everything – I, I like I have such a clear understanding of the space, the con- the confines of the space, and like mm-hmm. where people are and how like dire the situation is. And I thought that was really cool and like very western, obviously. And yeah, um, that scene has a lot of tension because of that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, all these there are all these shifting uh, like motivations right going on as the people are physically shifting through the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I always get really excited for that sequence. So yeah, I think the actually on Kessel and then uh, at the end on Dryden's ship are probably my favorite yeah. parts of this film. Yeah, I, I look forward to them the most, I think. Me too, me too. I would say yeah. Dryden. It's like that's tied for me. Both of those. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Perfect. The Kessel Run is really fun too. The Kessel Run has some weird beats in it that I still can't decide how they sit with me. Um, we're going to talk about the characters specifically in the next section, but... Yeah, those two parts really stand out for me. I don't like the beginning of this film. Yeah, uh, it's rough for me. But even more so, like the more I don't know. I, I when I first saw this, I was like the whole long sequence on Corellia. I was like they could have trimmed that down so much. I feel like they did. That's the scary part. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we we've, we've talked about this. It's like you could have just started the film with the coaxium with Han and Kira outrunning the white worms. Yeah. And you, you would have gotten all you needed to know Yeah, if they had just started – if you had, like, just extended their conversation while they're in the – what is it, like, the M68 or something? Yep. Um, you would have been fine. Yeah. And you could have shaved off, like, 15 minutes that we could have spent with, like, Val or any right. – or, or Kira or Rio or Beckett. Mm-hmm. Like, pick your dead character. We could have spent that time with them. Yeah. Um, and the, I know a lot of people really like the like trench part of the film and it's growing on me. Cause I know when we first saw it, I was like, I really don't like that whole sequence. I, th- I find it very confusing. I think it's confusing, but I love the, I love the character moments in that sequence. So do I, so do I. I, I like, I love when Han meets Chewie. Uh-huh. I think it's so oh, it's well so done. Good. I think so it's good. so perfect. Yeah. I love all all of that. Uh-huh. And I love how you can see that Han doesn't fit in with the Empire. Um, like when he asks what the objective is and they're like, well, we're bringing peace and prosperity to the galaxy. <laughs> and the guy is, and Han's like, well, we're, we're the, the hostiles. hostiles. And you It's their see, planet. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I love that moment of like getting to see a little bit that, yeah, Han Solo maybe is in it for himself, but he's also, he has some sort of moral compass. He thinks for himself. And that's something that we've always known about yeah. Han. Is like he is someone who questions a lot of things. Yeah. And like questions leadership and questions, I don't know, people's roles in things. And mm-hmm. I think that that was clear in that part. Yeah. This is interesting. This thought just popped into my head. Um, do you think – all right, imagine if the story had gone a little bit something like this. Because that whole sequence is necessary to meet Chewie and to meet Beckett. Right. And to get all of that. But imagine if we had shortened the beginning sequence on Corellia, like we said. and But after Han and Kira get separated, on the other side, like wherever Han goes is where he actually meets Beckett. And he spends that time with Beckett and, like, with the crew. Like, he immediately joins the crew. Yeah. And he keeps telling, like, almost like Beckett is kind of like an overlord to Han, but is like... You know, once we do this last job, then we'll go back to Corellia. Then we'll go back to Corellia. Then we'll go back to Corellia. Right. And Han's like, what are you doing? Like, you said once we got this money. Like, if they we had spent that it. time together to make the betrayal at the end of the film, like, that much more impactful. I don't know. That's, like, a really loose thought in my head. But I, I don't know. That would have been good. It could have been interesting. There's, like, a lot of different directions that they could have gone yeah. with 
especially Beckett's character, which just felt feels like a little bit of a parody. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. But um, <clears throat> so one question that I had outlined in our notes was, what are the themes presented in this film? film? This was a difficult question. I know. And that's, I think that's the problem. Yeah. I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but I think the number one thing is like, obviously, as most Star Wars movies are, the theme of like adolescence and growing up mm-hmm. is very prevalent in this movie. Maybe not so much so as it is in like, say, the sequel trilogy, in my opinion. But I think that obviously that is probably like a key theme and any key theme of like a prequel, right? Yeah. 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 But again, Han's big moment of growing up is later. Exactly. It's like, that's so, what's so, so it's weird. So it's so hard in terms of themes. Yeah. It's like, what is, is, what is, is like it? friendship a theme? I, I don't guess, know. I, I suppose guess, because of like Chewbacca. Yeah. He's only friends with Chewie though. He like <laughs> doesn't really become friends with Lando. Right. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's really tough to like nail it down. Yeah. Again, because it feels so episodic. Yeah. Another one that I wrote was like, in this, <clears throat> this isn't even really like a theme, but like I think there was a, the Han wanting to go back to Corellia for Kira like the entire time, right in the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. It, there's something up there about how you know Han shouldn't have like spent all his time like working to go towards like getting to, back to Kira when like clearly Kira like somehow moved figured on. out, yeah, moved out, got out on her not on her own, but like she was off planet. Yeah. And it's like, okay, Han, like you should have put in your energy to something else, like clearly, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's, it's like it, there's something there about like doing things for like for who you love, but also like remembering that like those people are also people. I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of like you have to remember that people are still doing things yeah. even if you're not with them. <laughs> exactly. Like Han had this idea in his head that Kira was just like sitting with the white worm. Right. Just, like, like still running errands. waiting for, for him Lady to come Proxima. back. Yeah. yeah. And like he just has this idea that she's going to be in that same like red leather jacket when he gets back there like ready ready to go. Like rev up the M68. Pretty sure the leather jacket's white but alright. Whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but she like had to forge her own path and it wasn't the best path. And it's, you know, she kind of alludes that it's not the path she wanted. Um, but it was the best she could do given the circumstances. Uh, yeah, this film is interesting when it comes to trying to pick out themes. And I think for Han, it is a sense of growing up and it's almost like he needed like part of his relationship with Kira was realizing that people change and that the world is not what he thought it was, Yeah, which is strange because even though he was with the empire and saw kind of all the evil that the empire was doing, um, it was really like Beckett and Kira's quote unquote betrayals that I think kind of. Oh, okay. Yeah. I get it. And then he just like saunters off with Chewy. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, I just I think I find it kind of tough to nail down these themes. Mm-hmm. Unlike, I don't know, the saga films or even Rogue One, where it was like Rogue One is like hope. <laughs> <laughs> and it's I, I don't know. I feel like it's it's just kind of interesting. It is interesting. It is. Um How yeah. do we feel about the ending of this film? I don't love the ending of this film. I think the ending of this film is really weak. Um, I don't. Again, it's like all these different threads of the story come together. And I'm kind of like, it's a little bit of whiplash. And I'm a little bit of, like, I feel like I feel more emotional about everything that just happened than Han does. Yeah. So it's like you get to Savarine. All right. You come off this great thing. Enfys appears Uh again for for the second time. But has this huge, quote, unquote, reveal with a long story. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, all right, I guess we're friends now. Beckett leaves. They do the whole bada bing, bada boom. Han's got the coaxium. He gives it to Emphis. He kills Beckett, which I don't think we've talked about this, but this moment sits really weirdly for me of Han killing Beckett. I don't know why, but it does. I like, don't know how I feel about it. Um, he kills Beckett. He's not all that shook up about it. Kira leaves. He's also not really shook up about that. And then they just walk into the distance. Two comments. One, 
surprised you're shook up about um, Han killing Beckett. I think it makes perfect sense. It's also as much as Han has learned, if anything, this is his character development. I think this is a weird place to put the whole Han shoot shot first thing. I think that's like annoyingly self-referential. Like that's, I feel like that's a whole separate story, but I think that like here he was, he, Becca was about to shoot him. So he was going to, he's obviously realized that he needs to have the upper hand into like, he was heeding all of Beckett's words. It just, and, yes. and like then we leave and we know that this guy is the smuggler potentially that we see in in Tatooine in the cantina because this is these are the type of risks that he will take. Yeah, but this is this like for this to be the first major serious risk that Han Solo has taken, besides just like kind of like conning his way out of a situation, like talking his way around or something to like kill someone yeah. that he's kind of forged this relationship with. Obviously Han, I think feels more deeply for Beckett than I think Beckett feels for Han. Cause obviously Beckett was going to kill Han for me. I guess I just don't see how in that moment Han wouldn't have like shot him in the leg or something. Well, because then he'd still be like a rival smuggler. Han wants to go like, I would have rather had it be like Han, goes to shoot Beckett and like someone else shoots him. But then it's not Han's moment. Like Han has to have that moment. But that feels weird for me to have like this relationship where they've, that they've built over the film, even though it's not necessarily like a good relationship, but it's definitely like they don't hate each other. But that's why Han holds him as he dies. And Beckett says, you know, that was a good move. Like you're not supposed to be like, Han, like, so evil and, like, no. like, shouldn't shouldn't sit wrong with you because in terms of, like, how that is handled, it is handled in a way that you're, like, Han was so right to do that. I don't think Han was right to kill Beckett. I think, I think Han probably could have convinced Beckett to, like, give him the coaxium and be, like, aren't, like, why don't, like, is this what Val would have wanted? Val would have wanted you to go back to Galen Sang or whatever it is and learn the Val Accord. I don't know. If that, I don't think Val would have wanted that at all. Val risked her life who for know, the end of that. Who knows what Val would have wanted because Val was out of the picture so soon. Um, yeah, I don't – I mean, I get what you're saying. And, like, it makes sense. I disagree with you about that completely. I know you do. I think it was – what I was saying earlier is, like, if Han had spent, like, that, those three years with Beckett, I think it would have strengthened the – the betrayal yeah. that Han felt yeah, yeah, yeah. where I think it would have well, landed a Beckett, little better. Beckett is a weak character. Beckett is a weak character. And like, um, that's it. But so I do, the, the movie ends in a way that yields a sequel. Yeah. And like, then you have like Han and Lando on that jungle planet, like when in the Falcon fairly. And I think that's great. I love that sequence. I think that scene is so I funny. I do too. Yeah. But like, it's, it's a weird place to go from Han watching Kira leave in kind of like confused puppy dog eyes. And then like, but not sad, just but like not sad. Oh, oh there, there she, she goes. goes. Yeah. And it's in, and, and then like, I'm just saying, but Ben Solo looks a hell of a lot sadder, sadder when Ray leaves than Han when Kira leaves. I know. So it's interesting though, because then you, you don't have a scene of like, Han and Chewie, or Chewie being like, oh, man, you know, bummer. <laughs> Girls, get away, or girl, something like girl that. Girl, get a girl, Yeah, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's there's none of that. No, it, it, it's strange. It's like <clears> I guess you do. You have that, like, moment of them looking off and, like, Han, like, holding Han. I mean, Chewie holding Han, but, like, no. so kind of, like... Is he holding or is it just like a hand on a it's shoulder? It's just a hand on a shoulder it's situation. Not, yeah. <laughs> it's not – yeah, I think the ending is a little weak as far as emotional moments. And what's strange too is like as we're talking, it's like the moments we love best in this film are the like comedy moments. Yeah. Like those are the ones we talk about the most. They're not the emotional beats of this film because those are kind of lacking. They right. are – not kind of. They are lacking. Um, and, like, the emotional depth that I think we were fed so much of from The Last Jedi <laughs> is just really absent from this film. I still think that's okay. I think it's okay, too, maybe. But, again, I think it would have been – the film probably isn't the best format for that then. I mean, I feel like the film could have – had definitely had more stronger emotions. It definitely could have. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. 
I don't know. I feel like we just spent like 30 minutes talking really negatively about this movie. It comes out, man. It comes <laughs> out. I do have a good time with this film. <clears throat> I laugh a lot in this film. I think this film is really funny. Um, I love that Kira didn't die. Yeah. I think we we're all really expecting that. I know I was. I'm glad she didn't die. Um, I loved how Han and Chewie met. I think that was fantastic. I think Lando was great. I loved all of their Sabacc scenes. Uh, the like basically like bonus scene at the end, I think, was really well done. I think the visuals of this film, like the special so effects, spe- like the whole castle run, I think looked amazing. And I was like, oh my god, the Falcon is so cool. Yeah. And I don't really feel that way about the Falcon. So <laughs> I think they did a really good job on that. But I think for me, the like the the plot development of this film was probably the weakest part. Yeah, yeah, definitely, um, definitely. Okay, so let's talk about the characters. Then. Let's move on. <laughs> Okay, so welcome to part two, our favorite part, the characters. So let's start with Han, Solo, the movie's namesake. (laughs) The classic character of Han Solo. That classic Han Solo. Solo. Do we love Han now? I like Han a lot more. Yeah. I like him a lot more than I did. You guys know that Han has never been on our top priorities as far as Star Wars goes. Yeah. Um, which, as I've said before, I think it's actually good for us coming into this film because yeah. we don't have nearly the kind of expectations or fears that I think a really big Han Solo fan would have had. Totally. So I, I actually feel really blessed <laughs> in that sense. And I really loved um, Alden's portrayal of Han. I think, as I said in the last part, the, the beginning of this film was a little rough for me on Corellia. And there were some parts where I was like, Oh, this feels like an impersonation of Harrison Ford's Han Solo. But I think it got better as the film went along. And I think for the most part, I think outside of the Corellia section, I think Alden did a great job. Me too. Me too. And I mean, we touched on this before about like in terms of Han's character development, everything. We we just talked about this, but I think that you don't really see that much change that much you know we know han as the suave smuggler but he didn't really know what he was he was always in over his head Mm -hmm. you know he's making it up as he goes along yeah and like everything was true in solo he was and i feel like that was almost by design so that we felt kind of warmed up to this version of han Mm -hmm. by alden and i think that's fair um but we didn't really get a, a ton of like huge character development you know, in yeah. in him. And okay, we've we've discussed this, so we can move on. But I do feel like I feel a lot closer to Han than I used to. I do too. And I think it's like now when I think of Han, right now I'm thinking of Alden Ehrenreich. Yeah, I know. It's so weird. It's so strange. It's so <laughs> strange. Um, I'd be curious to see what other people who are like huge Han Solo fans, how they feel. Because I think by and by, most people have been like really pleased with Alden's performance. It's like of the critiques of this film – I it's don't not think- like, Alden is the worst. Alden ruined Star Wars. Yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Alden ruined Star Wars. Okay, so I think we've said a lot about Han. And yeah. we'll, we'll come back to him. But let's I'm talk sure. about Kira. Love Kira. Kira, I think, when we mentioned this in our immediate reaction, like, Kira is our favorite thing to come out of Solo. I think that yeah. she is such an interesting heroine. And it's funny because when we were kind of – Diving into, like, speculation about this movie and, like, looking at the trailers and everything, we, at least I was, kind of annoyingly concerned about, like, potentially another romantic partner or something. I was, like, mm-hmm. potentially thinking about maybe she's Han's sister. Like You were knows? very much the Kira should be the sister. I mean, I, th- I think it would be still kind of cool, but it's fine. Yeah. No, I, I think so, too. And I I feel like I'm so, I'm so glad to be wrong because I am aware – um, you know, people have many romantic partners and people influence their lives in different ways. Like, I get it. And, and that's not it. I just I, – I feel like I am so glad to have been wrong about that because mm-hmm. I think that this aspect of Han Solo's past is something that, like, I didn't even know I needed. Yeah. And I ship it. Oh, yeah. No, I totally <laughs> ship it. Like, yeah, no, I ship it. I think if I had Alden just, like, coming around and was like – you want to go out and be like, yes, yeah, yeah. Even even if I knew it would never work out, <laughs> I just think it's so cool. Like Kira, this is what we know about her, right? Like in the beginning, she's immediately enamored by the M sixty eight. You know, Hans like you like she it. Knows, she's like, I love it. She knows her stuff. <laughs> yeah, she knows her stuff. Like mm-hmm. clearly, she's like 
now we were reading um, Most Wanted. Most Wanted, and she's one of uh, Lady Proxima's, like, Han and her are, like, the top uh, errand runners. The head girl and head boy. boy I think that's Scrum what they're Rats. called. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's really kind of cute. <laughs> and <laughs> the worm. The, well, I just, I, 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 I think it's like it's kind of scrappy. Well, you heard it here first. Charlotte thinks that Lady Proxima is kind of cute. No, I think that it's like <laughs> cute that, and like kind of scrappy that they like lived in the slums together and like, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's like kind of adorable. It's like perfect story fodder. It is. It definitely is. And like their sad backstory. A together. tragic backstory. Yeah, but they had each other. But the thing is, is that is it that tragic? Because like, I mean, of course it is. Kira is. Of course Kira's it is. Kira's is like is. the most tragic. And yeah. Like, the thing is, is that it's the, the movie doesn't the movie hints at it, but doesn't take it all the way there about like, you know, Kira never really got out of her situation on Corellia, she just like moved to Crimson Dawn. Different, she yeah. was as as she mentions in the beginning of the movie, snatched up by Crimson Dawn, right? When she's talking to to Han to Han about like, oh no, it's not like what'd she say? Like you can't um, when you le- when you get out of there, it's not just you're totally free. Like yeah, you, like we could be snatched, snatched up, up by, by the Crimson, Pikes or by Crimson, Crimson Dawn. Dawn. And Han was like, it'll be fine. And it wasn't fine for her. It's and, crazy that like a little foreshadowing that you don't realize yeah. is really there. Yeah. Um, I think Kira's storyline is probably the most like sinister within Star Wars. I think it's like the the subtext of her whole backstory is just very it's very like R rated. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, She's which like, I think is crazy because I think as an adult, like you kind of clearly pick up the hints that they're dropping and you're like, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. And like the way the way that Dryden only ever really touches Kira on the back of her neck, like holding the back of her neck. Yeah. That's like the most common place he touches her, I think is really telling and really creepy and sinister. Yeah, and his gross finger with fingernail. His thumb, long his thumb because he's semi quasi human. Yeah. Which are like, what does that mean? Regardless, Kira is like very much coded a like a slave con- concubine something yeah. and yes she is dryden's like right hand girl but that comes at a price and yeah, exactly. it's not like she has the freedoms and she's not mm-hmm. fully free until she kills him and even then she's still under maul's thumb yeah and i wonder if she like I, I think about that every time the end scene happens where where she's looking out in over to han in those like black and white um blinds which are obviously that sort of lighting in star wars you know there's a lot going on behind this like we've seen that with anakin we've seen Mm -hmm. that we've seen that many times yeah and it's just a lot of sinister it's very sinister yeah and it's like she's just thinking about you know she she made this leap to get above dryden but now Mm -hmm. is she gonna have to make the leap to get above maul and like how does that work and that's why i'm so interested in the sequel yeah because Maul, I guess, was ahead the head of Crimson Dawn, right? So, like, how, how did he get out of that? How does he get to be what we see after? Yeah. And it's like, do, it, does Kira somehow influence that? Does Kira, like, usurp him in that position? And that's, like, that's pretty badass. But at the same time, Kira, again, is still not free. Yeah. Well, I think it's – Kira's motivations in this film I think are so interesting to track, and I have a little bit different opinion of it every time I watch the film um, because clearly she is – I don't know what the right word is, but she's built a name for herself within Dryden's – Yeah, she knows harem, everyone. Her, like yeah. his harem, I guess you, you might call it. Um, so she has a level of autonomy, a level of power, um, a level – like Dryden has a certain amount of confidence in her, um, which I'm sure she's very proud of uh-huh. in like a weird way. Like it sounds weird to talk about it in these terms, but it's like to go from scrum rat to like top lieutenant, even though it's not ideal, it's better than scrum rat. Yeah. You know, like she's working her way up. And I think I think Kira always kind of has an end game of like complete freedom because that's what she says in the beginning of the film – when her and Han are trying to outrun the white worm, she's like, we're going to get off planet and we're going to go where no one can tell us what to do again. And we'll be free to make our own choices. So like, that is what is front and center in Kira's mind. And she's getting closer and closer to that. And I think you're right. And then like killing Dryden was like one step closer, but Mm -hmm. it was also a way of protecting Han. Um, But I think first and foremost, 
she wants complete and utter freedom. Yeah. And if she had gone with Han, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have, had, have she that. wouldn't have had that. And it's more of like tying herself down to someone else again. It's like she can't do that. Um she has to do this on her own kind of thing. I I don't know if I think Kira could overthrow Maul. Obviously Maul gets overthrown at some point from what we see in Rebels. I think it would be amazing if Kira was the one who was able to do that. <laughs> But I personally have my doubts just because Maul is, like, a crazy force user who's not afraid to just, like, slash her throat. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think I think right now I would say that probably Palpatine has something to do with Maul and Crimson Dawn's demise. Um, but I think Kira is, like, the closer she gets to Maul, the closer she gets to having more autonomy and more freedom – um, the higher up she is within Crimson Dawn. Right. To the point where it's like, I wonder if like right now her end game, maybe not her end game, but her next step is to have like her own harem, like Dryden, to become the next Dryden mm-hmm. kind of. Because then she'd get to control the ship. She'd have these people. She would have her own missions. Like she'd get to call the shots more. I mean, yeah. And that's what I think that it, she values that a lot. But and still like, wants out. But, still, or maybe, but at the same time, she, she doesn't now. She likes all the stuff. Yeah, maybe she doesn't want out now. Yeah. You know? and it, But now it's like Dryden's out of the way, so that whole, like, not safe for work component of it is is done. Yeah, but it's still part of her. It's so, still like, part of her past, certainly, but it's like he's gone, so that can't happen. Yeah, totally. Ugh, I love her. It's interesting. She's she's a really interesting character. I, feel, I just feel like we've never had any character like this in Star Wars before. Yeah. I think she, I've seen concept art of her as like an alien, and I think that would have been so cool. really, really awesome. So cool. Like unbelievably awesome. I don't know why we didn't get that, but mm-hmm. still. Yeah. Yeah. She's kind of like the opposite of Han in the sense of like when you meet her, you're like, oh, she's probably definitely going to be good. Yeah. And then she kind of is, but she leans more bad. Yeah. And Whereas, then, like, Han leans good. Right. And they're, they're both willing to take, like, these, like, big risks. But in the end, Kira is definitely bad. <laughs> Not definitely. She leans that way. She leans bad. She leans that way. Yeah. I think to a certain extent, Kira – I think Kira is really complicated in the sense of, like, she doesn't see a way out of this lifestyle, but she still wants – she wants to level up in this lifestyle – even while she doesn't want to be a part of it. Yeah. Still. But it's like she knows she can't leave it. Yeah. Like it's always going to be a part of her. She Like she can never get rid of what she's done. Right. Um, And she's going to run with it almost. I love Kira. I can't get enough of Kira. This is why I want a solo sequel. It's it, it's solely because of Kira. It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> I don't want a solo sequel. You guys have heard me say this. I don't want more solo films. And there are Luke Skywalker films. That makes me sad, even though now we're kind of at that point because – It already happened. I know. <laughs> so – But – Get over it. <laughs> if you want more content with Kira, it's like this I is know, the best I, format. It's going to be good. It's complicated. <laughs> I don't know. It's like I Solo is just okay. Yeah. Solo is just okay. Um, and do I want Kira wasted on another just okay film? I don't know. Maybe they'll just have like a Crimson Dawn movie with like Han moving in and out of it. That's what I want. I want to open up on Dathomir on the big screen. That's all I want. Dathomir on the big screen. Right? Yeah. (laughs) And I want to see like, thank you very much, Dave Filoni. Right. (laughs) Written in big letter. (laughs) (laughs) Please. Please. Give that to me. Yeah. Anyway, the sequel. All right. Let's talk about the crew because the crew is where there are a lot of problems, <laughs> um, particularly by the names of Val and Rio. So should we start from most problematic to least problematic or the other way around? Least problematic to most problematic. Okay. So Rio. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So very clear that these characters were not fleshed out. Not a lot of thought behind them. In besides, the slightest. We need a crew. That like we need a big shot crew. crew, yeah, or like something. Like we need we need something to like demonstrate that Han like needs to be taught about this thing. Like there's like a whole syndicate of smugglers, yeah, just like crewing together, yeah, and like they need to work together. Also, I swear, someone like three years ago thought of this line: "Big shot gangster putting down really? the crew you're in, you in," and they were like, "We're running with, with it, that. yeah." <laughs> but anyway, so Rio. 
Rio's a good character. He's fun to listen to. Has some quippy lines. It's all good. But at the end, I don't know why he really had to die. And like he, if he was going to die, why wasn't he shot in the chest? Why did they have right. him shoot shot in the shoulder? The literal shoulder. Like when he has two shoulders. It's just weird. Like if they wanted to, it's just odd. It's weird. It's. The whole thing definitely could have been like the character's a good character. He's he's fun. He's, he's got a, a cool good foundation. Alien. There's a there's something there. He just like didn't need to be a part of this movie. It was either give him some time or or we don't have him. Yeah, just ask him. Is I don't see why. I th- I feel like it even could have been better if like Han was already piloting that or like Beckett was like here we're we're trusting you with piloting. And if you screw this up, then I'm going to be so mad. And, like, then he screws it up or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And he, like, drops the, the, the coaxium in the same situation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like the scene doesn't even – like, I remember when he got shot and it was like, you see the shoulder, you're like, oh, he's fine. He'll just patch that up with some Bacta. Yeah, exactly. And it's like <laughs> – Rio is so, like, quippy, too. I totally, when we were watching it, I totally envisioned the scene going something like this. So Han gets up in the ship, and he's, um, he doesn't look great, and Rio doesn't look great. He gets into the passenger, into the pilot seat. He starts piloting, and Rio is like, it's not good to die alone, kid. And then he, um, like, looks like he's gonna die, and then Rio would pull, like, a fake out. Yeah. Be like, I'm just kidding, kid. Like, I'm fine. I got, like, two shoulders here. (laughs) I totally thought that's how the scene was gonna go. And I was like, wait, wait a second. He's actually dead? I'm like, who even is this guy? He's so cool. He's so quippy. He knows a lot about Wookiees. And he's just gone. <laughs> and I don't understand why. The Kasdans really needed to kill their darlings, and they just did it on screen <laughs> instead of off screen. I guess so. It just it doesn't even make any sense because he didn't. It's like the movie – if you took him out of the movie entirely, nothing changes and nothing – he doesn't He doesn't even, like, give anything, like, some advice to Han. Right. Nothing. Nothing. It's, it's frustrating. I mean, then it's no good to die alone, kid, is, like, a, a lot. But, like, Han knew that. Han would have guessed that. I don't – the thing is that Rio's whole thing was that he – it's like many have tried to be with me, but none can. But Han is already still, like, infatuated with Kira. Like, right. that's not Kira – that's not Han's problem. Yeah. It's it's just, like, ironic for Rio that he didn't end up wanting to die alone. Right. It's, it's like Rio had such cool potential and nothing. And we need another, like, great alien like that to just, like, stick around for a <laughs> – smidge longer than 13 minutes right you know it's frustrating the thing is is that also it's not even like dryden doesn't even mention rio Rio. when they you know he's like oh i'm so sorry to hear about val but like is it like rio so they could have definitely just been like oh like rio doesn't even show his face to dryden like dryden doesn't even know he exists so he's gonna go off into like another thing say he lived or something like that yeah and like they could have done that they could have just kept him around they definitely they didn't need to kill him for like oh my god the stakes i would have <laughs> <laughs> oh my god the stakes yeah because like you watch that scene and you're like the stakes are so high but then you're like are they really that high they're really that high because like i want to like these characters but you know 13 minutes is not a lot of time to form a connection um it's I would have, like, I mourn the loss of Rio and L3 scenes and even, like, Rio and Lando scenes. I I mourn them so much. (laughs) Yes. Like, it would have been so sad. All right. So, moving on up the scale to more problematic. You know, I don't think we're going to say anything that people can't say and haven't said already, but when Val died in the theater, we were both like, oh, my God, I can't believe they just did that. And, like... Honestly, not. It was the worst thing ever seeing the ramp up of promotion of Val after the premiere. Yeah, the two weeks after we see the movie like, and I like can't. the dedicated Instagram posts about Val and it everything. I was, was like, awful. this is infuriating. It was How dare you do this? Maddening. Yeah. It was- Oh, it was like we, Charlotte and I would send them back and forth to each other, like, can you believe that they're doing this? knowing that she dies and it's like everyone is getting so excited about val and, and like she has rightfully so it's a yeah. great thing that we now have a a woman 
black character in Star Wars. What the heck? This that has never happened before. Never happened and before, they, they, but then they treat her they like have, that. They have her have like six lines and die for, I think, that people would say man, man pain. pain. But, but not even is, a lot. There's no man pain. There's literally there's none. nothing that like is – you're, th- this this doesn't really change that much about Beckett because Beckett is again is kind of an unchanging character. If anything, he gets more cynical, like we've mentioned before. He yeah. just like, but but as more cynical, it's like, well, I kind of thought that's who he was in the beginning because he already didn't really. I don't know. It's just like it's kind of weird. It's so bad. It's it's <laughs> every time she the like once we get onto what what's the snow planet? I don't know. V- Van v- Vandar. Once we get onto the Snowpiercer planet, yes, it, it like it gets worse every time we see it. I'm like, this is the beginning oh, yeah. of the end. Yeah, it totally gets worse it, every single time. It's it's so it's so frustrating, and it makes me so mad. Um, and I just have to say, if it's really truly because she had to go back for like Westworld, re- like the reshoot schedule, like, yeah. Um, you know, they, they had Paul Bettany come in because the previous actor couldn't do it. Like Who who was the person of color, the original actor. Exactly. Right? Exactly. All right. And like the, the Like thing, those are practical things. Those are were. yes. Like I understand, you know, the fact is they had that a change of director, they had a lot of behind the scenes controversy and things had to move around. And potentially, I'm not sure, like I don't know, this is, hasn't been published anywhere. Like maybe Tandy Newton couldn't film any further. Or, like, maybe they had a whole other set of scenes that they would have to reshoot because they were a little too Lord and Millery that she was included in. And I, I'm just not sure. And I am i don't want to be the person that's giving the, like, annoying benefit of the doubt. But, like, because I, I really do think that it's inexcusable. But I would like to know what the story is behind this. Just yeah. so that I can give it like some, some sort closure. of context yeah. and closure that, um, that's, like, not, well, they just did this. Like, it, that you, is so bad. I think it's so bad. You want to believe that that's the reason. And maybe it is. Yeah. But also, it's like, it could have gone so many ways. And we were discussing this the other week after, like, our third or fourth viewing. It's like, what if Val had become this parallel to Kira? It, like, Val, because the whole, what we know of Val is that she doesn't think Beckett can play the Val chord. And uh, she doesn't – she's, like, frustrated at Beckett for not confirming that Emphis Nest isn't going to be on this mission. Mm-hmm. That, that's, like, pretty much what we know about her. Yeah. Um, so, like, what a table-turning moment if, like, Val had ended up going with Emphis Nest before yeah. we knew who Emphis was or even if she had ended up, like, going with the Zan sisters and, like, completely screwing Beckett over. Right. Because I think it would have really landed more with Beckett's whole, why the hell are you trusting Kira? You can't trust anyone. You would have gotten Val off screen if it really was a shooting issue with Tandy Newton's schedule. Um, It would have been this really great parallel of, like, Val was, like, she wasn't this good character that we thought she was like this good this like gold-hearted person but she had her own agenda separate from beckett as a smuggler would as a smuggler would yeah and because she was clearly already frustrated and like this has ha- happened before like and Fisness always shows up and that's what dryden says too and then it's like oh well val finally like learned her lesson almost and is like she goes off with his ancestors because that's going to be more successful for her. Mm-hmm. And then I think Beckett would have been heartbroken and irritated. And it, I think it would have played really well into all of his conversations with Han later on. Right. Um, and you wouldn't have had to kill Val off. There would have been so much more potential for that. Yeah. Um, Cause like the whole, the whole scene with after Beckett catches Kira and Han in the, in Lando's closet and, Beckett's like, don't trust anyone. And Han's like, you trusted Val. And he goes, I don't trust anyone. And you're like, okay. Like, I thought you loved this woman. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, but if like, if Val had betrayed him, they'd be like, whoa. Yeah. It, it would be like, whoa. It would have been whoa. And then at the end too, like before Beckett kill or before Han kills Beckett, it'd be like, oh, did, did Kira leave? Like, imagine if Kira had left. And he's like, did, just did like she Val. leave? Yeah. Like what that would have been you, so it good, been so interesting because that was already like in motion. It would just yeah. would have been great, and that is how you write out a character. 
<laughs> that has to move on for reshoots. Yeah, or even I mean, I don't. It, I don't it's know. it's maddening. It's maddening, <laughs> and it's not right. <laughs> and it's because she was so great, so good. She was so cool for those thirteen minutes, <laughs> and it just makes it all that more frustrating and hard to watch. Honestly, okay. <laughs> I all right. It was a lot. I'm sorry. I apologize. That okay. was a lot. So let's move on to talking about Chewy. Because in a lot of ways, maybe this movie should have been called Chewy, Chewy. a Star Wars story. Because Chewbacca and I feel like Jonas is Suatamo. I feel like I pronounced Jonas it. is so great. So great. He's so and great. Like the the new Chewy, like I feel like Chewy is the star of this film and I feel like I learned so much more about him and his personality and everything and I think maybe the smartest thing that Solo did was to get rid of the life debt and make Chewie his own person his the person who calls the shots that we all know Chewie is yeah. you know we've seen that before and like develop that and like I loved seeing like him like tear the arms off of someone like it was graphic man it was very it graphic, was graphic. But, like I knew they were going to do it and they did it what's funny is with last shot the whole thing of the like severing of limbs with yeah. wookies Oh, wow. And now we see Chewie do it, too. So I'm sure Daniel, who's a older, was like, yes, <laughs> when he saw that in the film. Parallel. Parallels. That's the connection we needed with that <laughs> shot. <laughs> and, like, I feel like we see Chewie's, like, huge heart, which we obviously know he has. Yeah. Of, like, going back and, like, helping his, like, Wookiee brother in and, like, then it just it gives a lot more pause for me when I will watch, like, the sequel trilogy and I'll see Chewie, like – you know, seeing Han killed and getting so angry, like, you know their bond. You understand, like, where it ca- came from. Mm-hmm. And, like, then you see, you know, Chewie and Ray like, piloting the Falcon together. I really just think it gives a lot more meaning to these scenes in a way that I didn't expect, and I just love Chewie now. Yeah, no, I love Chewie a lot more now. I think this film definitely could have had more Chewie in it. It's almost like if you weren't going to have a great – smuggler crew you could have just had Han and Chewie trying to do these things on their own <laughs> like somehow get roped in with Kira and dried in well, like, that's the oh. sequel Kayla that's the sequel that I'm pushing we don't need it <laughs> that's what this film should have been but it wasn't uh someone just like screamed in the, in the, the apartment above us so I'm sorry if you heard that but no, I think Chewie, I think Chewie was an absolute standout in this film, and I think his scenes with Han were so great. And I that's one of the things I've always really liked about Han's character is that he never talks like it's always very specific how he talks to Chewie. It's never like he's translating, or I mean, he is translating, but it's never like talking down to Chewie. Yeah, they're and equals. Which, yeah, when you know about Chewie's foundation as like his inspiration is George Lucas's dog, um, <laughs> like that would be a very easy thing to do. And I think they wrote it really well. Like one of my favorite scenes in this film is the campfire scene when they're on the Snowpiercer train uh, planet. I'm pretty sure it's Vandor. The Snowpiercer train, <laughs> Vandor, when they're on the snowy planet. Um, I think that scene is so great. That's like the only scene with really any kind of emotional depth to it. And when they ask, when Rio asks Chewie what he's going to do with his share of the money, and then he says it, and Han tells them, and he's like, but I don't know if he said tribe or family. And Beckett says, you know, what's the difference? It's the and most I, Star wars line. It's the most Star wars line. And it, there's something just, like, so beautiful about that scene and, like, such what if. Yeah. Um, from all of those characters, especially when you rewatch it, knowing knowing how Han's story ends, for one thing, and then also knowing that all of our time with Val and Beckett and Rio is very, very short. Totally. Um, but it's- Chewie, yeah, Chewie's great. And I think I just think that I'm I'm really thankful to this movie for like giving Chewie the spotlight for a little bit and like showing us what a great friend he is to Han. And I mean I think we've always known that, but it's it's great to see it. And I I think that Chewie is clearly the standout that not enough people are talking about. Like where are the Chewie stands? Where are the Chewie stands? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think yeah. I think he was. He was really great, and he never – like, that's the great thing about Chewie is he's just so kind-hearted and just, like, Chewie's just genuine in everything he does. Like, the scene when Kira is piloting the Falcon with Han, and he 
like doesn't get in her way, doesn't ask to be in the pilot seat, even though like he in his head he's probably like, I could do this in my sleep. He just like he lives and let lives. Yep. And there's just something really lovely about that. And, totally. Uh, I didn't think I'd come out of this film with a lot more chewy love. So much chewy love. But my chewy heart has grown three sizes. <laughs> Same. Um, okay, so next on my character list is L3. And I've already talked about in our immediate reaction how much I love L3. Mm-hmm. And I, we've we've loved her ever since Last Shot, and I think that we were always very concerned about her end, given right what to be. <laughs> yeah, given what we had read in Last Shot. If you guys haven't read it, I, I recommend it. I think it's a great book. Um, but I, you know, I've seen a lot of people talk about how it is. Um, concerning that they that the Kasdans potentially, I'm not confirming or denying this, have sexualized a female, the first female droid, female coded droid, and I don't think I fully agree with that because I I think that in any way I think that L three is her own person and that's kind of what I've always admired her. I mean, obviously, like you can look at this and think about how the Kasdans like wrote her as a character and obviously, but in, in world, I think that she is as much her own person as she can possibly be. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned this at the top of the show, like her death and her ending um, on Kessel is, was heartbreaking. I can't believe that that she died, but like I, we knew it was going to happen from last shot in a way. And I think that if she had – Caitlin and I were just talking about this before. Like if – say that the ending had been, you know, she had found her true meaning of like freeing these like droids from restraining boats and, you know, helping free slaves and everything in Kessel. How would it have been if L3 dies and then those same slaves and droids that she had 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 – you know, released and sh- showed the light of freedom had been like reshackled and put back into Kessel. And we saw that instead we have this like amazing portrayal of like this, this droid who is truly the most herself and the most human like than we've ever seen in any star Wars film. Mm-hmm. And we see her fulfill what she is most passionate about. And we know that from the moment we see her and at the very end, that is – she gets that what she has wanted always. It's interesting because so many people – it seems like people have really extreme reactions to L3. It's either love her, love her, love her, or hate her. She's like a feminazi social justice warrior, like crazy things like that. And I love L3. She's not my favorite character in Solo, but I love her a whole lot. And I think her – Like, she was the most clear to me in her motivations. And I don't know if that's just because I read Last Last Shot and so I know her a little better. Like, that's kind of like a hard line, I think, when you have these books that come out before the films. Uh, But I... It's frustrating the discourse around her, especially because Charlotte and I were just watching Rogue One and you see K2 and K2 SO spends the whole film talking about how he does what he wants. He says what he wants. He wants a (laughs) blaster. It's not fair that he doesn't have a blaster like he should have the choice to have a blaster. But no one has a problem with that. Um, Whereas L3 just says it a little bit more explicitly and suddenly like she's the terrible droid why would she ever be talking about this thing? But it's like, we love these humanized droids, but not enough to let them act a little bit more human. human yeah. I, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Um, I Yeah, it would have been, if L3, we were talking about this, and it's like L3's death is sad. I don't really see it as problematic. Um, whereas Val's death is certainly is- like highly problematic. Um, Whereas L3's is just sad. And I know a lot of people have talked about like the removal of her brain put into the Falcon. It's how she's kind of shackled to the Falcon, Um, which I understand that reading, but that's never how I've kind of interpreted that scene. I've seen that scene more as like her navigational maps being put into the Falcon, not necessarily like her being right or her personality. I could be wrong about that, but that's, that's how I've read it, and so I guess in that vein, it's I still think it's like a little bit of her personality, just because we get that line from three PO about like the most peculiar form of dialect. But I don't think it's like an invasion of her everything. 
by Same. being put into the Falcon, which, as we know, is a ship that has lasted for a really long time. I wonder why. Throughout all these – exactly. And it's obviously because of her. <laughs> so it's yeah. like – to me, I had this overwhelming reaction of, oh, my God, I can't believe she died, to, oh, my God, she gets to live forever in this Falcon that's – in this Falcon, in this in this ship that this, is – This one singular Falcon. Falcon. The ship that is so beloved throughout Star Wars that – and she is part of it. It is L3. Yeah. I guess – And it's like – to me, I was like, that is beautiful. And me I, too. Yeah. And I, 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 think, I think that's like – are people missing that? Are people – I do think that there's maybe something a little bit weird about how um, how Kira, like, pulls it out of her in mm-hmm. that way. And she's like, sorry, you know, and pulls it straight out of her. And I, yeah. like, I feel like that could have been handled with a little bit more care. I think it would have been better if Lando had been the one to do it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I think that, like, we could have had a scene of – like, the scene of L3 basically dying in Lando's arms is really heartbreaking. I cry every time. But – and if if Lando had been able to do that somehow and, you know, carefully remove these things from her mm-hmm. her bodice, then, like, poten- – <laughs> I know, yikes. Her bodice. But, <laughs> potentially, like, maybe that scene wouldn't have been so – yikes. Yeah. That's, that's, like, the only thing I think that gives me a little pause with L3's storyline. Um, but, yeah, I think it would have been better if Lando had done it. And that whole scene where Lando, like, goes after L3 is one of my favorite moments in the film. Like, you really see for as much as they kind of irritate and great at each other, they really do care for one another. Um, and they have a very strong connection and relationship, I guess, however that looks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it works. So. <laughs> yeah. She assures us. She assures us that it works. Um, <laughs> And the thing is, is that you even see in that moment, like, I I like that moment that you mentioned about Lando going after L3 when Mm -hmm. she's being shot at. Yeah. The, and then you see Han like, ugh, I guess I have to like like, deal with that. And then Chewie helps. Yeah, exactly. And like, that's that moment of like Han, again, the good guy, even though this guy is like so grating, they are like getting on each other's nerves so much that Mm -hmm. like Han will respect that you know, this person is ailing and needs his help and he's going to help. And like that is very, yeah, yeah, yeah. His, that's, is Han in a nutshell. Yeah. And then Chewie helps and it's like great. And he picks up Lando and L3. Bridal carry, man. That bridal carry. They're important. (laughs) They're important and they're everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Yeah. So let's talk about Lando. Um, What did you think of Lando in this film? I love Lando. I mean, I, I walked into the movie knowing that I was going to live in Lando. It's Donald in this movie. Glover, yeah. Donald Glover did a great job. I think that there's so many quotes from him in this movie that I think I'm going to be repeating forever. Mm-hmm. And I think the wardrobe is great. I love Lando's Falcon. The thing is, is that this movie isn't Lando a Star Wars story. And therefore, it's not like we got like this huge character arc of Lando. If anything, we just saw what we know about Lando. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Again, it's like none of these characters really change because they, they can't. can't. I, it's hard. And I remember being really surprised actually with how little Lando was in this film. I mean, he's in this film obviously a good bit, but it's like Kira and Beckett are in this film a lot more than Lando is. And it was like they were really marketing up Lando. Um, whereas it's like I feel like the market – like the promotion for Chewie was lacking so much, and Chewie, it's like Chewie and Han, yeah, not not Han and Lando, right? Um, which I think is interesting, but yeah, I mean, I think Donald Glover did a fantastic job. I don't think any of us were really doubting that, and I forget what show I was listening to, but they brought up a good point that it's like at this point, it's so hard to portray Lando because it is like he's almost like a caricature. Like, there's yeah, been that's more, really the thing. There's been more time of parroting Lando than we've actually seen Lando on screen. Like he is a really small part of empire or of uh, return of the Jedi. Yeah. Um, he obviously has a big role in empire, but it's, it's smaller still. We've like, definitely seen more of Lando in Rebels than we have. In, yeah. In the films. But even in Rebels, Rebels. it's like, He's just that suave guy. Like, there's never anything a little bit deeper. And um, it would have been fun to – I mean, I guess we did get to see that with him and L3 yeah. in this film. Um, but it was not as much. And, again, that goes back to the fact that this isn't Lando's film. So maybe if we were to see him, like, Lando having to be rough and tough 
I mean, I'd love or to more see of an it. action star, like and more of an a- not action star, but like in, I was imagining Lando in like a Fast and Furious kind of movie. <laughs> um, but like if Lando did have his own film, I, I think it would be really fun to dig into those little tidbits that he brought up, like about That's his what mom. I was gonna say. Yeah, like his, his even yeah his mom. I was just gonna say like even anything that the little tidbits he mentioned about like winning the planet and like the money pit and everything. Yeah. And like, I think that there's so many stories obviously to be told there of like growth clearly of like yeah. what, who Lando was and like his, him changing and everything that I, I'd fully welcome a Lando star Wars story. Yeah. I guess in that vein, it's kind of good that we didn't have more time in Lan- with Lando in this film uh, because we wouldn't, we would have just kept seeing these like caricatures of not caricatures, but like him just continuing to be Lando. Yeah. Um, as we know him in Empire. Uh right. This is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because totally. they are such iconic characters. And it's like Billy D. Williams, Harrison Ford. It's like how do you how do you really give them how do you make it about Lando and not about Billy D. Williams slash Donald Glover? Yeah. Which I don't know if they've really done that so successfully yet. Agreed. Which makes me question if I want a Lando movie, but you know, I wouldn't hate Donald more Donald Glover on my screen. So exactly. I guess I'm okay with it. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so finally the last character group that we're going to discuss is Emphis Nest. And Enfys is awesome and the Cloud Riders are really awesome. And I think you heard in our initial review and my our immediate reaction that Caitlin had a very visceral reaction to the <laughs> The, the her theme, you know, which is like a lot of chanting and everything. Sounds and, like Brother Bear. That yeah. was my first thought. Uh, yeah. The thing is, is that it's very alarming, but on second view, you're like, oh, it makes perfect sense mm-hmm. because they are not bad. So yeah. they're not going to have like an evil theme. Instead, they're going to have this really different theme because that's who they are. They are different. Yeah. And Yeah, exactly. And anyway, I think that there's I, – I, I really like Emphis Nest because I think that – I mentioned this in our immediate reaction too. Like, I think that it totally underscores like what Lucasfilm has been trying so hard to do in describing like the start of the rebellion and how all these different people are coming together and everything. And I think that Emphis, it's just so awesome that like behind this, like, I don't think we can take this for granted. It's like, we have this amazingly cool, like huge costume with like so many layers and like an insane mask and, Yes, it was leaked that it was a woman a couple weeks before, but I still think that, like, it is quite the reveal that, like, they take off the mask and it is a teenage girl Mm -hmm. with, like, wild hair and who is immediately like, I need a drink. Like, it's (laughs) so awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I think that – I think the thing is is that everyone left that movie being like, oh, there's – there's really not a lot of bad things to say about Emphis because there's something there and I would read it, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would watch it. Like, I think that there's – I I love that. Like, the gang of her people, like the Cloud Riders, like the team. And you read the Visual Dictionary and you find out that, like, they never really land and they're just always on those swoop bikes. And <laughs> it's like, wait, what? So cool. They're like a traveling group. And they they all come from these terrible circumstances that, like, make them want to fight back. It is, like, the principle of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And it is really, really cool. I'm dying for more. I do think that, like, I maintain what I said about how I think her little speech that she gives is a little confusing. Yeah. And it has taken me four times to fully grasp the whole cutting out the tongue thing. And I'm still like, if you ask me what it meant or like what the, her whole speech was, I can give you the gist. And obviously, obviously I know what she means by all of it. But if you were to ask me, like repeat back exactly what happened to her and her family, I, don't, I couldn't. No. And, I, it, and it's just because I would have liked for there to have been a couple breaths between that speech. And it's annoying to me that the screen time didn't allot her that much time. To do that. And I think that's that's where I lay the fault. Not the actress. Nothing like that. It is, all right, if this is really an important crux of the last, you know, the third act of the film, then give me the time it deserves for me to root for this person. Which obviously, like, us going into it, everyone in that theater is going to be like, yes, the good guy. Like, well, you're going to know that, right? Mm-hmm. But, like, I still think that 
the audience would have used what it could have used a little bit more pause in that whole scene. I completely agree. I love the framework of emphasis to a really big degree. I hate the execution of it. Uh, I don't think it was done well enough for the amount of intrigue and like badassery that Emphis Nest, I think, could have been in this film. What bothers me, I think, the most about her story arc was that she makes this great appearance in the train sequence, which I think is great. I think they're really formidable. I love that whole sequence. Aside from what happens with Val and Rio, I think the action is really good in that whole um, train fight. But then she's never really... I mean, she's brought up again, but she never really poses that big of a threat. I don't know. I the, mean, the only threat is the the homing beacon. And like, put, how many times can the Millennium Falcon have a homing tired. beacon it's beacon tired. on it before <laughs> they like put up some kind of sensor that's like where L three is like, hey, you've got a homing beacon on you. <laughs> you know, like how many times can it be done? Um, this goes back to my thinking about it. This goes back to my other storyline about what if. So if Han had been with Beckett for like three years, Han would also know how much of a nuisance Enfys Ness is at this point, And they could have all been like talking about it together and like continually bringing up like, oh, well, remember when Enfys did this? Remember when Enfys did that? Oh, she always shows up. Well, no, it doesn't even have to be she. You're using well, she. Yeah. Like well, it would have been way more interesting if they like there's only like two times I think where they throw around he pronouns. Which yeah. automatically like brings in the intrigue, yeah. but like it, if if there was more conversation about it, then I think because I think that it's it's a he and a them, and I think that maybe if there was a more conversation about like oh him and all his like crazy people, like he's so powerful, he always you know steals this whatever. Yeah, like it, it would have been great if there was more conversation around that. Yeah, I'm just envisioning a <clears throat> scene where it's like where that fireside scene where if Han had been with Beckett and their crew for like three plus years at this point, they all know each other really well. And Val is like, did you take Emphis into consideration? And Beckett's like, I don't need to take Emphis into consideration. Like I got it on lockdown. And you could have each one of those characters in a comedy moment be like, oh, well, what about on Savarine? <laughs> oh, what about what happened on Corellia? Oh, what about what happened on Kashyyyk? Yeah. And Beckett would have been like, stop it. Like, <laughs> I think that would have been really cool. Yeah. And it would have underscored that like these people have shown up a lot yeah. and put a wrench in Beckett and the crew's plans. And it's like, you only get that one sequence with Emphis and then you're supposed to have this great payoff of her at the end. And it doesn't, you don't, like you said, you don't spend that time with her to have that payoff be as good as it should be. I do think it's a really cool scene when they're walking up to the the, the, the top of the, the, on Savory, and they're walking up to the top of like the bar and like everyone's looking at them and it's very quiet. And upon mm -hmm. second watch, you're like, wow, these people have been really hurt they are really ravaged by Crimson Dawn. And I think that that in itself is super powerful. But I – Yeah. No, I do too. Yeah. And I just like – I think we just needed more. And I think we that's – that's, ob that's obviously like the problem of being uh, – you know, there's something about like us being like, oh, like it would have been great if we had more. It would have been great if we had more. Like as a Star Wars fan, we're interested in like literally everything. And yeah. And we just want more of everything. You know, and it's yeah, like I yeah. want I want more time to be spent on this because this really reflects a lot of the themes in Rebels. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that maybe maybe the general audience doesn't feel that way, and maybe that's just us. And I that's, think that's something that like we need to consider. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say too. It's like do, I think we can really appreciate where Envis is, like what her role kind of in this greater galaxy is right now because we know. Like Hera, Hera's out there doing the same thing that Emphis yeah. is doing. And I think that's really special for us. And I wonder if maybe it would have been better to like maybe not have as much time with Dryden yeah. and have more time with Emphis if that's going to be where you're ending this story. Like if your big reveal at the end is Emphis and Beckett's betrayal, why are we spending so much time with Dryden? Yeah. Um, which I'm not saying I necessarily know the answer, like if it, if that was the better choice, uh -huh. but I know that emphasis reveal isn't as impactful as I want it to be because I don't think the film spends as much time with her as they should. Right. Um, to really ramp her up as this villain and then be like, well, wait a second. Like I have to rethink everything I thought about her. Just like another character we know and love, Kylo Ren. <laughs> 
True. <laughs> you didn't think I could get through this episode <laughs> without mentioning Kylo Ren, did you? Um, anyway, yeah, I love I think this. we've already mentioned Kylo Ren. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're probably right. You didn't think I could get through this episode only mentioning him once. once. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure you've mentioned him twice. You didn't think... <laughs> I could, I could get through without mentioning him three times. Half a dozen times. Twelve times. <laughs> anyway. This has turned into a Pendemption episode. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> Retitled. Retitled. Um, yeah, I think I I do want more emphasis. It's, I think, yeah, I think you bring up a good point. It's like, where do you spend your time as Star Wars fans who know what Emphis is doing? Of course, we're like, oh, they should have spent more time with her. Uh-huh. And I think... If they do have any thoughts about sequels, it's kind of like, okay, where is it better to be spending story time? Is it with Enfys and ramping her up as a villain, or is it with Dryden, comma, Kira, comma, Maul? Yeah. I and think I guess we that, don't know the answer to that right now. I think that if they're sequels, I kind of don't want Enfys Nest to be in it. And maybe that's controversial, but I think that, that I want the, the the story to focus on Han and Jabba and Tatooine, and then also on the side of it have a Maul and Kira situation. And then, then that's the main story. And because I think you, ha- I feel like a lot of people already feel like this. Like we've run into a little bit of issue about Han helping the rebellion already, and like this is, this is his his major turning point in A New Hope is him helping the rebellion and like coming back, you know, for this cause. And yeah, he's really coming back for his friends, but he sticks around, and you mm-hmm. know that. You know that deep down he believes in the cause. Yeah. And I think that, it, you know, that's obviously aided by now what we see in in with him with Empress Nest in Solo. But at the same time, it kind of minimizes in a way the fact that like this is – that A New Hope is Han's like first touch point of, of the rebellion. Mm-hmm. And if there was a sequel, I wouldn't want Enfys, clearly part of the rebellion, to be back into it. Yeah, I agree. I think you make a good point, too. I know a lot of people have had issue with Han kind of helping the rebellion at the end of Solo, but I really didn't think it was as big a deal as I think some other people do. I think it's just Han is no friend of the Empire and doesn't want it with the Empire. Yeah. And so he's giving it to the rebellion. Right. And I don't even think he really has a clear picture of what they're doing with No, it because the rebellion isn't even really a thing. It's not. And that's so, like, that's, we know that now. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that necessarily. Right. Uh, watching this once they, if they ever really pick up on what Emphis is doing. Right. Because um, like you said, it does take more than one viewing to really <laughs> understand what's going on with her. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying about not having her in subsequent sections, uh, sections in subsequent sequels. Yeah. Because it would just be like, whoa, what is Han doing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Should we move on to part three? Because we have a lot of questions. We have some questions. Yay. Listen, big deal. You got another problem. Women always figure out the truth. Always. All right, welcome to part three, where we're going to be doing a little bit of a catch-all and some listener questions that we received from you guys from Twitter or from email. We love getting those emails and questions, so you guys know how to find us if you want to send them our way. Um, But let's – we have surprisingly not really talked about this at all. How is the mall edition to this film? Is it inaccessible for the average Star Wars fan? Is it too much? So I come at this with a couple of different viewpoints. I think it is not inaccessible. I think it's fine. That's kind of where I land. However, when we went to go see this movie with my parents, they were talking about how this movie must take place within the time period of The Phantom Menace. It's crazy. And it's just, and my mom then my mom was like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Then Han would be like sixty. That's gross, you know. And it's like that's not how it works. <laughs> and I think that like. My mom, who is, you know, a fan on the surface, right, that doesn't really dive in. She listens to what I say, but she's not, you know, keeping up with the timeline, doesn't know what BBY stands for. You know what I mean? (laughs) Whoa. I know. (laughs) Deep cut. Deep. Uh, (laughs) BBY. Okay, you know what I mean? I would – She's a fan. Yeah. She's seen all the movies. She understands that Darth Maul was in The Phantom Menace, too. She would be able to understand that. Yeah. And tell me that. But (laughs) – at the same time, she was confused by it. 
And I think that that says something. But at the same time, to me, I'm like, that, I don't see why that's a huge issue. Right? Like, I don't, I really don't see how it's super problematic that, you know, you would have to like use your brain a little bit to <laughs> figure out the timeline of this, that you would have to observe that Maul has robotic legs, that you would have to make that leap in this fantasy movie that Maul potentially could have survived. Mm-hmm. And then, so ba- so basically, you come into this movie, and we started the show and me telling, asking Caitlin if like this would be a good entry point. And I think that if you say this was your first Star Wars movie, you would be like, oh, who's that guy? Yeah. Right? And you would be you would look into it and you'd find this like treasure trove of amazing content of Maul and the Phantom Menace, mm-hmm. Maul and the Clone Wars, Maul and Rebels, a, you know, and then now Maul and Solo. And I think that there's really something there about the connectivity and the connective tissue between all these different mediums. And I don't necessarily think that you need to have seen Clone Wars or Rebels to understand Maul's motivations and who or who Maul is at this point. I think that yes, you can come back and you know, go return to these sources, like spend a couple hours on Wikipedia understanding who he is. But I think that we are giving people a little bit of like the the short end of the stick of like using their brains to understand that like to make that jump of, oh, Maul must have survived. That's sinister. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Or like, oh, who's this guy? He's not the emperor. He is this like weird alien who has a lightsaber. Yeah. Whoa, Kira's underneath him. Like the implications of the scene are that, you know, Kira is working for someone sinister, right? Yeah. It's not it, – for us fans, it's exciting because it's this like amazing, as I mentioned, connective tissue between all these different mediums in the shared universe. But at the, at the core of it, it's Kira's not working for the Emperor. She's working for someone who is clearly aligned with the dark side, the dark force, something evil, right? Powerful. Powerful, evil. Mm-hmm. And that's honestly – all you need to know. Yeah. I think even if you were just a fan of the films, like if you only – if you were a pretty deep Star Wars fan but hadn't dived into Cloners and Rebels, I don't think it would be too hard to make that leap of like once you would see Solo twice, you know, at least twice, you'd be like, you know it's coming. You can take more stock of what's going on in the scene. You see he's got the robotic legs. You're like, oh. And they make a big point to point it out. They have you like hear the, they, sounds the sounds of it. It's yeah. great. And it's like, oh, okay, I can see, like, I can suspend disbelief to be like, okay, it is, um, Maul has survived. He's got these robotic legs somehow. And he doesn't, like, clearly he's not Darth Maul anymore. Right. But he's still got his lightsaber. He's yeah. got a lightsaber. He doesn't have his lightsaber from the Phantom Menace. Uh, like, Ish has gone down for him. Right. And I think you can leave it at that. But Exactly. The, like... The the petty part of me is, like, really happy that all these people who have kind of stayed away from the animation, like, if they want to dive in, they're diving in on Dathomir. <laughs> and, like, that, We just rewatched it. Oh, my God. It's, Guys. Oh, it's so crazy. It's so There's, intense. like, zombies. And so, like, imagine that's your first. That makes me giddy. That's, like, <laughs> baptism of fire. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think that's, like, really awesome. I think I, it's, I'm, I'm not a negative on that one. I think no, it's great. No, I think it's great that people – if people never watch Clone Wars and the first thing they watch is, the, like, the Night Sisters <laughs> and they get to meet Lady Mother Talzin. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I and love like, that you're introduced so to much. Ventress and, like – And Savage. Her, her intense backstory. And I just think, like, it's just – I think it's a great – experience of dipping your toes into all that Star Wars canon has to offer at this point. Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of annoying comments of like, oh, I guess this means the TV series are canon. They've Hello. Canon. They've always been canon. They've always shouts from and, rooftop. And maybe the the worst thing about the fact that you're saying that is that we haven't had clear understanding of the connective tissue. Yeah. And yes, we have had characters like Saw Gerrera, which was a huge step. It was great to have him, but at the same time, he existed independently of his character yeah, and this in, is, in the in the Clone Wars. Yeah, and this is so much bigger 
Yes. Um, Because it's a character that now has gone from big screen to small screen and back to big screen, which I think is really great. And I think gives a lot of legitimacy to the animation shows for people who don't feel that way about them. And you guys have heard me say this a couple of times, more than a couple, I'm sorry, um, about like wanting a big connection like that. And I think Maul absolutely was that. And Charlotte and I have talked a lot about maybe who could have been in this position um, to have been the big reveal character at the end. And Maul really is the best, like, fringe main character <laughs> to put into Solo. Yeah. It's like Boba Fett wouldn't have landed as well. He's no. not as, No, no, no. Like, if, if they gave me Boba Fett, I would have been like, eyes. WTF. Yeah, I would Get this clone out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I would have, I would have been like, oh, that's the big reveal. Yeah, like, oh, of course, yeah, it's it Boba is. Fett. Like, yeah. Maul came out of left field, and he's got this crazy force background that we don't see in Solo at all. And just to get this little taste of it at the end, I think is really cool. I'm not mad at it. No, I'm at not all. Either. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Caitlin was on our network's like main show. Um, you should check it out. It's on Jonah Marie's Rebel Chat feed if you want to watch it. Um, I was sick during that night, so I wasn't on it. But she had talked about how, you know, there was a, a slash film article that had recently come out with Ron Howard, and he talked about how in the script it it was it wasn't listed as Maul, and they hadn't really decided that it was going to be Maul until like obviously when Ron joined, probably until like pretty close to the end of filming, and it was listed as Boss, and they potentially had like thrown around a lot of names, and the Maul one just felt right. And I can totally see how all those conversations happened. You know what I mean? Like, I I, I really feel like it it makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think it really does. Because you have someone like Dave Filoni and Sam Witwer who, if you guys have never, we did this. I wrote this little um, piece for our website that kind of has a breakdown of some of Maul's chronology. Um, but at the end, there's also this playlist of like Sam Witwer, Dave Filoni, and even a little bit of Ray Park talking about Maul's characterization through these um, TV shows and films. And Sam Witwer is such a huge Star Wars fan. And like he knows everything and he just has such great insight into the characters so you guys should definitely go and listen to some of his stuff about Maul if you haven't already um but to have someone like Filoni who has been playing such the long game in Star Wars to include something like that like you know that it's meaningful and it has a purpose um because Dave Filoni is always thinking 10 steps ahead I know some people don't like all of the 10 steps ahead that he thinks but he is always thinking ahead, and so it's great to have him be included in a little bit bigger way, at least that we know of right now. Like, who knows what kind of things the animation department has been sewing into, helping to sew into these films that we just haven't seen yet. Um, but as of now, anyway, I think it's really great that he's able to take this character that has spent the bulk of its timeline in animation and bringing it to the big screen. Right, right, which was a risk to begin with. Yeah, huge risk. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting to like follow that, you know, that that storyboarding of this character and how how we got here. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's really important to me that we see this story of Kira and Maul somewhere else again because it really just sets up something so interesting. And just to re- like I don't know. I feel like it 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 is we're both on the side of it's not Maybe it's slightly inaccessible for some people, but mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's not the hardest thing to research and go to. No. And I also want to make a comment about the second time we saw Solo in Boston. I observed someone walking out of the theater and they were talking about, oh, like, I've never seen the shows, but I always thought he was part of Black Sun. I'm really confused. Like, I thought he was part of Black Sun. I had read, he, he was like, I read everything on Wikipedia, but I didn't know that he was part of Crimson Dawn. And I think that maybe that's how a lot of, not a lot, but I feel like we're a little bit underestimating people's interest in in Star Wars characters mm-hmm. or anything like that, because clearly this person had gotten known enough to- Know the Black Sun. Know Black Sun, but also had never seen any of the animation, but had dove deep into- you know, Wikipedia to yeah. find out these things. Yeah. And it's, again, I just feel like it's not that hard. It's, yeah, it's not. And if you were really that interested, you would find out. I'm surprised Charlotte hasn't said her her tagline here of 
Trust the audience. Just literally trust the audience. <laughs> I mean, that, I used to say that all the time. I feel like I haven't said it in you a really long in time. A while, but, but, you know, it's something that I really am, have always admired about Star Wars recently, especially, of like the trusting of the audience is like they, they, they understand that you have the ability to make these judgment calls yourself. And maybe in the past like couple of years or like these two movies – Maybe it's proven that like people have vastly different interpretations of the story and maybe we're trusting the audience a little bit too much. <laughs> but I think that this is an occasion of trust your audience. They will understand if not the like the, the every intricate backstory of this character, they'll understand why the character is there. They can put two who, and two together. Who the character is. They're not thinking this character is like a good person. Yeah. And that's no. all you need to know. Yeah. No, they're not. They're not. Um all right. Well, let's go on to some questions from listeners' time. <clears throat> I feel like we should have theme music for it. All right. I'm going to put in some theme music here. Kiss a Wookiee, kick a droid, fly the Falcon through an asteroid, till the princess is annoyed. This is spaceships, this monsters, the Star Wars, we love it, come and help me, Obi-Wan. X Wing fighter and the blaster gun dance with the walk so we're fun. This is spaceships, this monsters, the Star Wars. We love it. Great, right. love the theme music. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so our first question is from our very good friend Amy Wishman Nalen, and she asks, "Did Kira really love Han?" sacrificing herself to stay behind to protect him or was she playing him all along she definitely was not playing him no i think it's no she was she definitely i don't know if sacrificing herself to stay behind to protect him is really the right form of sentence because yeah i don't think she's necessarily sacrificing herself at all there was nothing really to sacrifice she was gonna leave Mm -hmm. You know, I think in a way, it's like she's grown past Han. Exactly. At this point. It's exactly. like she really wants to be that person that he left on Corellia. Uh -huh. But the fact is she isn't anymore. And he doesn't understand that. And he doesn't understand that. Um, and I think she does. It's kind of what we were saying earlier. It's like she's in this life for good. Uh -huh. And maybe she doesn't want that 100%, but she's going to level up. Right. And she's going to do what it takes to do that. And mm -hmm. I think there's something really intriguing about that. Yeah. And then her second question was, did Solo give you any new ships? You know, the kind I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, we're all about Kira and Han. <laughs> Very much about Kira and Han. This is a sexy movie. It doesn't demean, you know, anything that I think about like Han and Leia because mm -hmm. obviously they are – They're know, end game. They're the best. Like they're great, whatever. But Kira and Han have some serious chemistry. Did you guys know that George Lucas uh, directed that scene in the in closet? The closet? Yeah. Very sexual. <laughs> <laughs> what um, I think is funny is there were a couple people on Twitter who had been talking about the soundtrack titles, <laughs> and everyone was like freaking out about the track entitled Lando's Closet, and everyone thought it was just going to be like a bop. Yeah. And uh, we saw Solo, and the next day I was like, hey, Charlotte, you know that Solo, like Lando's Closet is where Han and Kira make out. And like that's the track. It's like super romantic. <laughs> it's their love theme. It's their. It's literally their love theme is entitled Lando's Closet, <laughs> <laughs> and it was really fun to um, see watch that people unfold. think that. Yeah. yeah, to see that unfold. So totally. that was fun. Um, and then <laughs> Amy's last question was: Heard about a job? Big shot gangster putting together a crew. You in? Yep. We're we're, we're very in. We're like head of the crew. <laughs> We are gangsters at this point. We are the big shot gangsters. <laughs> so funny. Thank you for your questions, Amy. Um, our next question comes from our other good friend, Swara, who asked, how do you feel about the resolution of Kira's arc in the film? What, Where do you want her story to go from here? I feel like we've answered this a little bit, um, but I'm pretty satisfied with her arc. I think that she, at the end, she makes a choice, and I admire her choice in that moment. Mm -hmm. So... Um, where do I want her story to go from here? I really want a sequel and I want her to be the star of it. I don't know where I want her story to go from here because I don't know if I want a sequel necessarily. Uh, but I'm happy with where she ended in the film. I like that her motivations were a little dubious. You know, she cares for Han, but she also has some form of self -persever perseverance and kind of like with Han in a way, she's kind of putting herself first in this moment. 
um, depending on where her biggest motivations lie. Like, are her are is her biggest motivation to protect Han, or is it to get rid of Dryden, or is it to get closer to Maul and therefore earn another degree of freedom? Right. And I think they're kind of all three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So our next question is from a lot of good friends. These are all good friends <laughs> from Britt, <laughs> um, who asks which I really like this question is which track from the soundtrack adds the most to the narrative in your opinion? Um, I definitely think it's anything to do with Envis Nest. I mentioned this before about her theme. It's, it's very jarring, but at the same time, like that's the point. And upon second view, you realize that she is, um, her theme isn't menacing because she is not menacing. Yeah. And I and, and like the rebellion is the good guys. Yeah. So I think that if if anything that totally adds to the narrative because upon further viewing you get way more out of that track and that, you know, that scene when she is inter- introduced than um than you would originally. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I think hers definitely has the most um it's different. Yeah, it, yeah, and it has the most impact on the story as a whole. I will say the one I keep replaying from the soundtrack is Meet Han. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> I really like listening to that one a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I forgot to mention, Caitlin and I had the pleasure of getting to see John Williams, like, last week in um, conduct the Boston Symphony Orchestra here. The Boston Pops. The Boston Pops at the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And it was the world premiere of him. It was Wednesday night. So the movie premiered on Thursday to general audiences. And we went to go see it on Wednesday. And that was the world premiere of him, you know, presenting his Han Solo theme to the world. And we had heard it before, but we, like, couldn't handle how lucky we were to be there. Yeah. And um, I think I'm going to include that audio at the end of this episode as the player out if you want to hear it. It's maybe not the best audio, but it was really fun. I forgot that I recorded that. I did a bad thing. (laughs) I recorded it. Um, If you guys remember from our celebration episode, there's – we have a – rough recording of the Princess Leia theme from when John Williams recorded it. Right. So now we've got this rough recording of the adventures of Han Solo and there's something like really poetic and lovely about that. Okay. Wow. All right. Moving on. Our next question is from our friend Neil who asked, do you think any of the Lord and Miller elements were kept? Yes. I think, I think probably the Corellia aspects was where Lord and Miller and maybe even the empire where we meet Beckett and Chewie for Lord and Miller. So I've thought about this a lot and I agree with you, but you know, when I'm watching all these interviews and it's, it's kind of fun to like parse like what parts that did the actors film with Lord and Miller, what parts did, are they referring to with Ron Howard? And, you know, Alden has referred to the fact that they have filmed on the train sequence for so long. And Mm, yeah, it was something like, nine months they spent on the train (laughs) filming the train sequence and this was last january and if you remember the director the director shift happened in july and they had picked up refilming in august so that then they didn't wrap until like before christmas so it was like they spent so much time filming this train and every time i watch this movie now and i knowing that about like how they filmed the train with lord and miller and they also picked up the train shots with ron howard i feel like there's a couple of elements in the train shot that are Lord and Millery. And I think the number one that I will always go back to is Han falling straight onto the train and going, I'm okay. <laughs> and I feel like that is, yeah, it, it feels out of place. It feels weird. And every time it happens, it's like, that is the slapstick humor that everyone was referring to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think you're probably right. And to the moment where uh, they're Han and Chewie are uncoupling one of the cars behind them, and they're like, "Yeah, we did it!" And then they get shot, yeah. like a blast, and they're like, "Whoa!" They're like, "Whoa!" And they like back away. Yeah, that yeah, I think you're right. Um, that interview is interesting because just like a funny aside, Alden was mentioning how Murder on the Orient Express was filming on the same train stage essentially, and he's like, "They wrapped before we did." And uh, that whole film takes place on a train. 
<laughs> Which I think is hilarious. He, it, it seems like he's very exhausted by the train <laughs> sequence. And I think that's just very indicative of the fact that, like, they were on it a lot. They were on it a lot. So, yeah. like, what does that mean? It's funny. You know what I mean? It's so, funny. it's it, it's actually, like, I recommend it, guys, like, thinking about, like, the timing of when they refer to certain scenes and filming in, in interviews as you're watching it. Because it really is kind of fun to parse, like, what, what did they have to reshoot? What did they actually reshoot? You know? Yeah, I agree. Can't wait for that behind the scenes documentary in 50 years. <laughs> yeah, in 50 years, <laughs> like it's not coming anytime no, soon. No. Um, all right. And our next question is from Dave Whalen. And he asks If you were in charge, how would you have incorporated Darth Maul into the movies? The same way it happened. Yeah, I think honestly, yeah, because it's like you want him to be a big part of the story, but he's not, he can't have that. Like we already see his moment with Obi Wan, and that's like Maul's big moment. Um, in the Clone Wars and in Rebels. And he can't, I wouldn't put him back in the saga films because no. that's just like too much fan service, I think. Right. I think that I really think this is the best place for him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And so our next question is from Catherine Crow. And she asks Do you guys have a favorite costume from the movie? Um, I think my favorite is Kira's, the, the, cape that she stole from Lando when they get to Kessel. I love that cape. Oh, man. It's so great. The red cape. Yeah. The red and blue cape. It's great. It's so great. I love that outfit. I also love that she stole it from Lando. Right. And then at the end when the Falcon's on fire and she uses it to like uh, spot out the fire and Lando's like, that's a custom piece. <laughs> and I think that's great because she's like, whatever. I wore it. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not an outfit repeater. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I had, now I don't have any attachment to that. We got to get the fire out. I just, I really like it. It's great. That's funny. I really love, I love all of Kira's outfits. Her black dress is just like knockout. It's yeah. so great. It's so great. I love her hair. I love the gold. Uh, femme fatale femme fatale to the max but yeah. I also love Lando's outfit in the very last <laughs> sequence with that the, shirt the like Hawaiian shirt which next time you go see Solo you can actually see that shirt in his closet when, when, when Han Kira and Kira are, are making, making out. out yeah <laughs> it's great it's great you can see it and then our last question is from Amaria who asks what did you think about Han being shocked that criminals he hung out with actually did crime I think it's funny. <laughs> it's funny, and it just goes to show Han's naivety. Like, yeah, yeah, that he really has no idea what's going on in the world. Right. He's learning slowly but surely. He is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot to learn. <laughs> and I guess maybe we'll see that in another sequel. I do think it's funny, and I think that's a funny element of like, oh man, whoa, I'm joining crime. Oh no. They're criminals. Crime. Yeah. Heart of gold. gold. Yeah. <laughs> I think that it's kind of funny, but uh, suspension of disbelief is good. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Anyway, I feel like that's going to wrap up our episode. This is a long episode, man. It's very long. Yeah. But I hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you want to leave us a review on iTunes, we really do appreciate them. So you can just head on over to iTunes, search Sky Talkers to subscribe and or leave us a five-star review. It really does help out our show. Um, if you guys want to follow us on Twitter, we are at Sky Talkers Pod. And then our personal Twitter accounts are at Clarity, that is Charlotte. And then mine is at Caitlin Plusher. You can also find us on skytalkers.com for all sorts of good things, as well as our Instagram, which is Sky Talkers Podcast. <laughs> Basically, we've got a lot of social media. Pick one, follow it, subscribe to it. Let us know your thoughts on Solo. Yes, definitely. And I just want to thank our awesome patrons, Joanna, Amy, Amy, Katie, Kyle, BJ, Courtney, Brian, Jim, Diana, Lynn, Megan, Becca, Brad, Suara, Angela, Kelly, Susanna, Rachel, Daniela, Chastity, Ali, Cherie, Katie, Serene, Shireen, Alyssa, Rebecca, Travis, Natalia, Sarah, Lauren, Kels, Alaya, Delaney, Daz, Andy, Pablo, Angela, Matt, Aaron, Connie, Adam, Brandon, Stewart, Derek, Kirsty, Robbie, Molly, and Chuck. Thank you guys so much for supporting us. Thank you guys so much. If you guys didn't know, we now have a Discord set up for all of our Patreons across every level, so it doesn't matter how much. Um, you get access to our Discord where we have lots of fun channels set up to discuss things, and um, it's been really fun so far. So definitely recommend, um, and may the force be with you. May the force be with you. And now enjoy the selection from John Williams. A.K.A. my phone recording. <laughs> 
Friday night solo openings. And I won't spoil it for you, but it has a lot of history. history. Um, where he gets his skills and his attitudes and all that sort of thing. Eventually, grows up to become Harrison Ford. This is a theme of adventures in Palm. And so, without telling you any more about it, here's probably the eight tunes.